This is CTV's W5. Here is Lloyd Robertson. Welcome to W5. In the United Kingdom, dial 999. In the European Union, dial 112. In Australia, dial 000. And in Canada, dial 911. Those telephone numbers all connect you to the local emergency services, your lifeline in time of crisis. There's no doubt that since the three-digit emergency number was first used in this country in 1959, that many lives have been saved. But just how reliable is the system? Recently, 911 calls have gone tragically wrong in communities across the country. And as Victor Malarik reports, it's left some questioning whether your 911 call will bring the help you need when you need to call for help. A manhunt is underway in the streets of Cranbrook, British Columbia. It's a week before Christmas 2007. Inside this house lies the body of Tammy Ellis, shot and left to bleed to death for more than 20 minutes, despite repeated calls to the RCMP-operated 911 call center. She was too good to leave so early. To Lynn Nealon, Tammy was not simply a close friend and roommate. She was her inspiration. Tell me a bit about Tammy. What was she like? She was one of the most bubbly, happiest, helping, concerned people for other people I've ever met. She was a good soul. I think God made a mistake that day. I really do. Their tiny house was already cramped. But according to Lynn, Tammy had taken in a friend who was having trouble with a boyfriend, a man with a violent past. But then that boyfriend showed up outside their house one night. Tammy went out to talk to him and calm him down. She came back inside, locking the door behind her. But that wouldn't stop him. He kicked the door right in, tore this completely off, and then proceeded into here. He stands right here. Um, he called Tammy a name, and that was it. Boom! Like, right there. Shot at close range, Tammy collapses. Lynn grabs the phone. She and the other woman seek refuge in the bedroom. Your best friend is dying on the floor. Yeah. You're dialing 911. Hiding under a mattress. What's happening when you hit 911? All operators are busy. Please hold. Please hold. Please hold. My girlfriend's dying in the living room. This is an emergency number. There should be no hold. There should be no hold. Who in their right mind thinks that 911 would have a hold button? So Lynn hung up and called back, and this is what she heard. All emergency operators are busy with other callers. Please do not hang up. Your call will be answered. On hold, again. If it would have been a live person, at least I could have yelled at them and said something to him. Did you think the killer would be coming back into the house? That's the only thing I could think. I didn't know if he was outside. I didn't know if he was still in the living room because we were hiding in the bedroom or in the alley, like, or if he was just reloading and coming back. Eventually they take your call. How long did it take from the 911 call for emergency services to get here? I've been told that it was approximately 22 minutes. How far is the ambulance service from here? It's less than a minute. Police say they were delayed getting to the house, in part for safety. They first set up a perimeter to try to catch the shooter. When they finally entered the house, it was too late. Tammy was dead. 18 hours later, police arrest this man, Cheyenne Learn. He's charged with first-degree murder. According to police, Learn has criminal convictions for violence and weapons offenses going back 30 years. 911, what is the address of your emergency? When you call 911, a dispatcher is supposed to answer immediately and relay your call to the appropriate emergency help, fire, ambulance, or police. So why didn't Lynn get through to 911 in the first place? Lynn's calls were put on hold because according to the RCMP, it was an unusually busy evening at the 911 call center. 
That center is based here in Kelowna, more than 500 kilometers away from Cranbrook, where the shooting took place. It's responsible for all 911 calls for most of the southern half of BC's interior. That night, only two call takers were on shift. And when Lynn's calls came in, one of them was on a coffee break. Oh, look at the for Tammy's parents, Don and Betty Mikulski, the circumstances behind Tammy's death are almost too much to bear. Oh, I just can't believe that. It just pounds in my mind that she laid there and for 21 minutes and bled to death and nobody showed up. When you heard that 911 had put Lynn on hold, what goes through your mind? Well, that's just absolutely made me furious then. And uh, I said to my wife, I said, we got to do something about this 911. So with Betty by his side, he hit the streets of Cranbrook. I come to pick up some petitions here? Yeah, they're right here. All right. Collecting Great. signatures on petitions oh, right on. in an effort to have a 911 call center set up back in Cranbrook, just like it was until 2004. Oh, a bunch here for you. And gathering support for an inquest into Tammy's death. We really believe in what you're doing. Well, we really you. need 911 here. When he drops this latest batch at his local MLA's office, Hi, Courtney. The tally is impressive. Got some more petitions for you. Excellent. Good stock, eh? Huh? Excellent stock. Probably <laughs> nearing 10,000 by now. Uh, yeah, I guess so. 10,000 signatures and counting. Not bad for a community with a population of only 19,000 people. But that's not all. Here's the desk I would like you guys to see if you uh, could play it for us. Don's even written a song and had it recorded by a local musician to raise awareness about his crusade. But it didn't need to be this deadly tragedy. And Derek Corchega, the program director at the local radio station, has agreed to play it on air. The biggest amount of respect to you for taking this tragedy and doing good with it. Yeah, thank you. Good, sorry. Yeah, me too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is this for Tammy? That's for Tammy. But it's also for the community to understand that, hey, 911 wasn't working. And please understand that. Well, here's a couple of here when she's young. But Don's determination to bring about change in the wake of Tammy's death is taking a toll on an already devastated family. Yeah, time goes by, eh? He doesn't sleep half the time, and he's just, just right at it. And I'm just worried about him now. And I don't need to lose another one. Person that I loved. <laughs> too many 911 calls for too few operators. Delays followed by death. Sadly, it's a pattern that preceded the tragedy in Cranbrook in other cities across Canada. Vancouver, September 19, 2006. A family member of this man, Michael Spruill calls 911 to say that the schizophrenic man is contemplating suicide. The privately run call center here is especially busy, with 14 calls already in the queue. The family's call is incorrectly prioritized. Spruill himself calls back an hour later, saying he's slit his wrists and was bleeding to death. Sixteen more minutes pass before a police car is sent. When they finally get inside his second floor apartment, Spruill is dead. September 8th, 2007, Ottawa. Ottawa Fire, what is your emergency? A jet ski was just floating down the river with, with nobody on board. The search for a missing jet skier along the Ottawa River is delayed for three hours due to a 911 mix up. Dispatchers confuse that emergency call with a separate call involving another person who had been out on the water but returned safely. The jet skier is later found drowned. Police admit the case was not appropriately handled. People sometimes make mistakes. And then there's Hamilton. Hamilton police could have prevented the murder of my son. Frisia Wise's son Lucas was not unlike a lot of 18-year-olds. Growing up, he played football and spent a lot of time with his extended family. But all that came to an end on Friday, February 17th, 2007. Lucas and a group of friends are hanging out at a local bar, the Dizzy Weasel. 
It's around midnight when a fight spills out into the parking lot. Lucas's friends are in the middle of it. A man pulls a knife and two of Lucas's friends are stabbed, one fatally. The man with the knife flees, but then comes face to face with Lucas. A struggle ensues. Lucas is stabbed four times in the back and dies. Ten hours later, the police arrest this man, Corey Rogers. He's charged with aggravated assault, attempted murder, and two counts of first-degree murder. When you heard that he had been arrested, what was your reaction? I was very grateful and I was very th thankful um, that this maniac was um, apprehended so quickly. I truly thought that they wanted to catch him for what he'd done. <laughs> but then, of course, he found out otherwise. <laughs> what Frisia found out was that her son's death may have been prevented if only a pair of 911 calls had been properly handled. Corey Rogers, the man accused of stabbing Lucas and his friends, was at the time wanted by the police on previous charges of assault and robbery. A week before Lucas was killed, Rogers had called 911 to turn himself in, not once, but twice. Yet instead of following policy and sending out a police cruiser to pick him up within 15 minutes, the call takers told Rogers that if he wanted to give himself up, then he should take a walk over to the police station, which of course, he never did. To make matters worse, at the time of the calls, Rogers was Hamilton's most wanted, but that still didn't seem to make his call a priority. Eventually, nearly an hour after Rogers' first 911 call, a police cruiser was sent over to his place, but by that point, he was long gone. How can they make Hamilton's most wanted? How can they have that? And then when the man calls, and you're looking at it on the screen, that this man is a violent offender, and who he is, and then just say, well, you know, you think maybe you could walk here? An investigation into what went wrong followed, and recommendations were implemented to improve the 911 system. But as far as Frisia is concerned, no one with the Hamilton police has been held accountable for Lucas's death. Their investigation came to the conclusion that there was no wrong here. Sort of, oops, we kind of blew it, but... But we're, we're not really to blame here. Where do you go from here? I really loved my boy. I loved him more than anything in this world. And I don't know where to go right now. I really don't. <laughs> if any community knows about the importance of effective 911 service, it's Winnipeg. The birthplace of 911 in Canada way back in 1959. But also the site of one of the most horrific 911 tragedies. February 15, 2000. Sisters Corinne McEwen and Doreen Leclerc called 911 five times over the course of eight hours. Corinne's former boyfriend, William Dunlop, is harassing them. Police show up after the first call, but Dunlop lies about his identity and they leave. As for the next three calls, well, listen for yourself to what happens when Doreen tells the operator Dunlop is violating a restraining order and has stabbed Corrine. He has stabbed my sister. Okay, well, one of them has to leave. So you choose which one. One of them has to leave. Well, get them, yeah, like I don't, I don't understand why they're together right now. They're both in breach of this order. Get him to leave. If get him to leave. No police car is sent. Three hours later, Doreen calls 911 again, desperate for help. Oh, please help me. They're fighting. Okay, we'll come. Okay. okay. Bye. But again, they didn't come. No police cruiser is sent, at least not until after this last call. 
The voice you'll hear is Dunlop, the man later convicted of double homicide. Hi, it's the 911 operator. We just got a uh, 911 call from that address, 849 Manitoba. I need to know what the problem is. Oh, there's no problem at all. No. Well, I heard a female yelling, so you're going to have to put her on the phone. Uh, she went to the bathroom. She wasn't in the bathroom. By the time police arrived, both women had been stabbed to death. It was like Dunlop had the knife. 911 gave him the go-ahead. Okay, here's a good one here. Arlene Meadows lost both her sisters that night. There's me and Dotsie yeah. doing karaoke. The years have done little to dull the pain for her and her husband, Hank. And it could have all been prevented, sir, if 911 had done their job. But they didn't. They played God. Or maybe I should say they played the devil. Arlene, when you're sitting in the courtroom and you hear your sisters pleading for help, it must have been a nightmare for you. Nightmares you wake up from. This I don't wake up from. Every day. Every day I hear my sisters calling 911 for help. And I hear these 911 operators denying them the help they needed so desperately. As far as the 911 system goes, things didn't work the way they should have. Police Chief Keith McCaskill has spent 30 years on the Winnipeg Force. The seemingly preventable deaths of Doreen and Corrine left everyone in Winnipeg, including the police, searching for answers. The public was wondering what happened. Our members were wondering what happened. The people who were involved were, were wondering what happened. It was, a, it was a very tragic event all around. When you listen to those 911 tapes, the five calls, each one getting more and more frantic, what goes through your mind? I don't know that anybody can really get down to why this actually occurred, why didn't we respond, other than to say mistakes were made. And we, systemically, in the service, uh, we knew we had to do a better job. A public said? inquest was called, and two years later, dozens of recommendations were made to dramatically change the way 911 is run. Well, there were 62 recommendations, basically, and talking about all of the things that potentially could be improved in the 911 system. Improvements like better integrating 911 service with the police force itself, including stationing a senior duty officer right in the 911 call center. 911, what is the address of your emergency? The police can also now monitor live calls, which they didn't do before. And most importantly, more extensive training for 911 call takers. McCaskill insists the tragedy has impressed upon his force the importance of remaining ever vigilant always looking for new ways to improve 911. The 911 system is a lifeline across the country, there's no doubt about it. And we've got to be able to do the, our part to do the best we possibly can. We've got to do things and put together procedures, for instance, to stop the abuse of 911 as well. And there's a lot of that. Frank Grimaldi agrees. 911 is being abused, swamped by non-emergency calls. Grimaldi is the manager of communication support with the Ontario Provincial Police. Approximately 50% of the calls that we receive are what we deem as not emergency or non-911 calls. 50%? Approximately 50%. Calls like these. 911, what is your emergency? What are the ice conditions? We want to go ice fishing today. Where are you? We're out in the lake. Hi, I'm planning a road trip to northern Ontario next month. What are the road conditions going to be like? What's the area code for 911? Ontario Provincial Police, where's your emergency? This dispatch centre in Orillia, Ontario, receives on average 350 calls a day that are non-emergencies. Is he hurt or anything? First level officer will be there. Every second we potentially lose because we're dealing with a call that is a non-emergent call may potentially cost someone's life because we cannot respond as quickly as possible because we're dealing with non-911 calls. An important message, but one that does little to help the grieving families who have lost loved ones when 911 failed them. Grief that never goes away. Eight years have passed since Corrine and Doreen were murdered, but Arlene and Hank's suffering 
has never subsided. People say, well, when is the should mean time for closure? What's closure? Can anybody tell me what true closure is? Our true closure is when we're dead. Then we don't have to worry about that pain no more. Emergency services in Kelowna, Ottawa, Hamilton, and Winnipeg all report that they have made improvements to the way 911 calls are now handled.